I don't know about you, but sometimes I have uh, strange dreams. Uh, maybe you're like that, but I remember once I had a dream that there was like an invasion of uh, lawnmowers, and they were all gathered together at the train station in Macomb. I, <laughs> there may have been some deep significance to that, but I don't know what it is. I had a dream once that I was, uh, I was doing a concert at my grandparents' apartment, which was very small, but because we didn't want to make a loud noise, we were singing into corn cob microphones and using rubber guitars. I see, you know, I wake up sometimes and go, what in the world did I eat? And I need to make notes so I never eat that again. That's just weird. Well, I've never had a dream that I came away and said, wow, this was profound. But throughout the Bible, there are people who do have those kinds of dreams. Uh, Joseph was a person who was able to interpret dreams, and he um, had dreams, and that made him significant. That helped him to move up into the position where he, we see at the end of this, he ends up second in command in Egypt. Daniel uh, was able to be spared in his life because he had dreams, and he also was able to interpret the dreams of the king. So, Dreams are significant in the Bible, and today, if you listen to some of the people coming out of uh, Muslim nations who are becoming Christians, many of them will say, the only way we heard about Jesus was because Jesus appeared to us in a dream. Isn't that cool to think about somebody who's never heard about Jesus encountering him in a dream? So there, there are all kinds of stories about dreams and the significance of dreams, but what we're going to read today is a very significant um, vision, it appears, that Abraham had. And since he was in a deep sleep, I'm going to call it a dream. But this is a bit of a weird dream as we read it. And yet it's of high significance, one of the highest, one of the greatest dreams that we could ever imagine. In the first part of Genesis 15, you remember the, the story that God told Abraham, reaffirmed Abraham, that he was going to have uh, a lot of descendants. But Abraham said, yeah, Lord, uh, excuse me, but you remember I'm really, really old, and so is my wife. Um, we're a little disappointed because we thought it would be one of our children. It looks like it's going to be our servant who's actually going to inherit the blessing. God said, no, 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 hang on, hang on. I can do all things. Just wait a minute. I am going to give you Yep, old man, you and your wife are going to have a child. Now, God reaffirms his covenant to or his promise to Abraham about the land. Listen to verses 7 and 8 again. The Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, how can I be sure... I will actually possess it. Now, there are times in the Bible where when somebody says, yeah, but God, um, I'm not sure that you're trustworthy. Well, remember Zechariah, um, the husband of Elizabeth in the, the birth narrative? He said, uh, Lord, how can I be sure? And God said, mm, you're not going to be able to talk. That's how you're going to be sure. You're not going to be able to talk until your son is born. God's very patient with Abraham, and maybe this is because Abraham is still growing in his faith. Maybe it's because he's still learning. I don't know, but I'm encouraged by that because it reminds me that God is patient with me, and I give him thanks for that, and we should give thanks together that God is patient with us. Then he goes on, and he, he's very specific in what he tells him to do. The Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, apparently of any age, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the half side by side. He did not, however, cut the birds in half. Some vultures swooped down to eat the carcasses, but Abram chased them away. Now this is kind of weird. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep. A terrifying darkness came over him. Then the Lord said, you can be sure 
you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. So far, it's a bad dream. But I will punish the nation that enslaved them. It's getting better. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. As for you, you will die in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. After four generations, your descendants will return here to this land for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. And after the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot. This is where it gets weird. And a flaming torch passed between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to you and your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates. Now the significance of this today is, of course, one of the reasons that the nation of Israel is fighting so hard for their land in the Holy Land where there's this constant battle is because the Jews say God gave us this land as a permanent inheritance. And it's based largely on covenants such as this. Now what's happening here, it, it seems weird, but for the original readers, this wasn't all that strange because uh, what's happening here is what would be called cutting a covenant. And so what would happen is they would take these animals, they would cut them in half, they would lie them next to each other, but there would be a path kind of in between. And so two parties, generally, would testify to what they were going to promise to each other, and then they would walk between these animals as a way of saying, may it be to me, as has happened to these animals if I do not fulfill my part of the covenant. In other words, if I don't do what I've said I was going to do, then may I be cut in half just like these animals. Now, that's a pretty significant promise you're making. It's a lot better than cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye, you know, that which is pretty gross itself. But this is much more significant. Now, it seems weird to us, but it gets weirder, doesn't it? because we've got this smoking fire pot and this torch that go through. Now, we're told that Abram was in this deep sleep, and then God spoke to him. Was that in the dream, or was that, did he wake up? I don't know. But the smoking fire pot and the torch represent God. Now, what's significant about this is that God is making a promise to Abram and is basically saying, this promise is contingent on what I have promised alone. The smoking fire pot, representing God, came through those animals as if God was saying, look, Abraham, I'm making a promise to you. In other words, what I'm saying to you is this, if I do not fulfill this promise to you that this land will be yours, may I as God be cut in half. May I no longer be God. May, may I be stripped of all the power that's mine. That's how significant this covenant is. And that's why it's such an amazing passage because this is not like most covenants. This is not a covenant where, where God is saying, look, Abraham, I will give you this land if you do this. So let's both walk through the the. the split up animals as a way of saying that Abram, I'm promising to do this, and God says, I'm promising if he does this, I'll do that. doesn't do that. Abraham's asleep. But God comes through here as his way of saying, this is what we would call this a unilateral covenant, that this is, this is a promise to, to Abram without really any conditions at all, other than God's character swearing to him. That's pretty impressive. But now I want to take you over to the New Testament. And I want to read to you the fact that God does the same thing to us over in the book of Ephesians. We read this. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. What God is saying is, look, if, if you will trust me, if you will just believe my promise to you, 
then I will, I promise, based on my own character, promise that you will be saved. That's significant. Over in Philippians chapter 1, Paul says, He who began a good work in you will bring it about to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Who begins the work? God does. Who finishes the work? God does. We often feel that it's dependent on our behavior. It's not dependent on our behavior. It's dependent on the work of Christ on our behalf and God's work in us subsequently. Now, we're going to change. We're going to live different lives. God's going to change us, but it is all of grace. It's not of the things that we do. Over in Romans chapter 8, remember, Paul asked this question, what shall separate us from the love of God? Remember what the answer is? Nothing. Nothing. Once we belong to him, once we have put our trust in Christ, nothing can separate us from his love. And he goes through this big, long list of tribulation, persecution, death, famine, you know, all this stuff. And we could, we could list a whole bunch of other things. But the promise is an unconditional promise that if we trust him, now, maybe that's the if, but when, when we trust him, when we are confident that he is faithful to his word, then we are saved. And that's an incredible promise from God. Now, the text goes on, and there's these details that God gives them. I'm going to jump to, you know, he saw the terrifying darkness, verse 13. Then the Lord said, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. Now, that's not exactly good news, is it? But then he continues, I'm going to punish that nation, and in the end, your people are going to come away with great wealth. You're going to die in peace and be buried at a ripe old age. That could have been any time because he was already at a pretty good ripe old age. Then he's very specific. After four generations, your descendants are coming back here. Now, what that tells us is that God is not guessing at human history. God's not saying, well, if everything works out okay, here's what's going to happen. That's not the case. God knows what's going to happen. God knows the path that he's going to take us through. Now, that doesn't mean that God makes bad things happen, but he knows that bad things are coming, and he already has a plan for how to bring us through those things, the minefield that we call life. So God ordains our lives. He knows where he's taken us. When God makes a promise, we say, ah, I, hope God can, I hope God can get me there. Stop saying that. I'm confident God is going to get me there because God is in charge. You remember the three points we always say? God is in control, he loves me, and he never, ever makes a mistake. Those are the three things we can build our lives on. So they're going to be in Egypt, they're going to be in a foreign land. Now we know from reading the rest of the Old Testament that God, this is fulfilled completely. They're in Egypt for 400 years. God sends the, the plagues and all that stuff leading to Passover at the end. They finally leave, and all the people are paying them off, saying, hey, take all the gold we've got, just get out of here. We don't want you people here anymore. Get out of here. And so they end up rich, and they finally end up in the promised land. So it's, it's a great story. Suppose God said to you, you know, I, I want you to know I'm going to bless you. And you're not going to see it in your lifetime. You're really not going to see the, the full effects of the blessing. But four generations from now, and I don't know what that would be, your children, grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, when your great-great-grandchildren are growing up, boy, there is going to be such a blessing on them, and they are going to be faithful before me, and they're going to do great things for the kingdom of God. Would that lift your spirits? Would that make you feel good? Or would you say, well, that's a long time. I don't know about you, but I would be saying, you know, I would be grateful to know that that far down the line, my family was still going to be faithful and that God was still going to be working in them. What a great promise that would be, isn't it? So 
this is, a, this is an incredible passage. Now, the question we ask is, so, okay, this is interesting, this whole covenant thing, that's informative, I hope, the fact that God's making this promise contingent only on his promise. Okay, got that, that's nice. What do we take out of this? Well, the first thing I, I think is important is that every one of us is craving for assurance. We would all like to know that we know what's coming. We would all like to be sure of heaven. Now, what I want you to understand is that God wants us to be sure. Over in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may, what's the word? No. K-N-O-W. You might have knowledge. You might be sure that you have eternal life. Hear that. I've written all this stuff in this book so that you can know that you have eternal life. And I know when you say to your friends, oh, I know I'm going to heaven. They go, well, aren't you, don't you think you're good? No, no, that's not why I think I'm going to heaven. That's not why I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven because God fulfills his promises. It has nothing to do with my performance. It has everything to do with his grace and power and mercy. Let's look at another passage. John chapter 6, verses 36, 37 actually. Those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will, what's that word? Never reject them. Never. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up the last day. Wow. So you say, well, I, I'm afraid that I, I'm, you're not going to be the one. You're not going to be the one. He's not going to lose even one. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, it says, This is why I'm suffering here in prison. I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. And we sing this sometimes. I know those I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. That's from here. I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. I am sure he's able. And then finally, I want to take you to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. We've looked at this before. It's a great passage. We read it sometimes at funerals, but listen to what he says. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful, and now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return, and the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. See, God wants us to be sure of our salvation, and, and the way we do that is to take him at his word. I want to give you a couple of lists here. If we want to have real assurance of salvation, what we're learning is that we cannot trust our emotions. We cannot trust our experience. We cannot trust our progress. We cannot trust our list of good deeds. We trust Him. In my book, Faith Lessons, I know it's a shameless plug, but I'm also acknowledging where I'm getting this from. I give this list of why God wants us to know we are saved. He wants us to live with gratitude rather than fear. He wants us to spend our time getting to know him rather than always trying to find him. He wants us to trust his grace rather than our efforts. He wants us to keep looking forward rather than constantly looking over our shoulder afraid that evil is gaining on us. He wants us to serve with confidence rather than to be shackled by fear and uncertainty. He wants us to repent and get up when we fall rather than to be depressed and simply give up. He wants us to enjoy the journey rather than simply endure it. So take the Word of God for what it says. Believe God like Abraham did 
and say confidently, if you've put your trust in Christ, and that's the question, have you sincerely placed your faith in Jesus? Is that where all your hope lies? Are you trusting that God's sacrifice on my behalf was sufficient for my salvation? Are you willing to trust him as Lord and say, this is the guy I want to follow for the rest of my life. God, please help me to do so. If so, then stand up and and testify to the fact that I know where I'm going. And people are going to laugh at you. They're going to give you a hard time. But continue to point to the promise, not to your performance. Second, the road to fulfillment is not always as expected. And that's what this story of Abraham is all about, isn't it? That Abraham figured that God was going to do something a certain way. That while they were still fairly young, they were going to have this child, and then they'd have lots of other kids, and then they'd have kids, and the family would grow really big, and it's not happening. And they're freaking out a little bit because, God, um, we're getting older. The promise isn't getting fulfilled. What's going on here? Lord, I'm just not sure what's happening. And they do all kinds of dumb things. And next week, we're going to see a really the dumbest thing that they did in order to try to help God. <laughs> Always a bad idea. Don't, you don't have to help God. God's got this under control. Just work with him. You don't have to help him. But they do all these things because they didn't understand that just because we have a plan for the way that God's going to fulfill something, that's not always his plan. God, God's got an interesting way of bringing us to where he's promised he's going to bring us. He will get us there, but not always in the way that we expect. It's possible that that's what God is doing with you. It's possible that the road that you're on is not the road you expected to be on. But I love uh, one of the songs that Jason sang Thursday night. It was a song that said, maybe God's not late. Maybe God's not delayed. Maybe God is right on time. Because God knows the way he takes us. And if we trust him, we will find that his promises are true. Another list for you. God does not always heal people physically, but he does heal. Sometimes it's spiritually, emotionally, and best of all, eternally. God does not always come through to save what we have. Sometimes he lets us lose our stuff so that we can find that which is better, which is him. He does not always heal our relationships. Sometimes he opens door to new discoveries and even on occasion new relationships that bring us where we never dreamt was possible. Sometimes he doesn't take away our pain. Sometimes he gives us a way to use our pain to help other people. And sometimes the money doesn't come. But what's replaced is a feeling of contentment is what we have. I don't know who said it, but I think it's probably true. God is never late, but he's also seldom early. (laughs) He's always right on time. Finally, God's promises are not always unilateral, but but the ones that are shall lead us to worship. Now, what I mean by that is that sometimes some of the promises in the Bible are actually promises that are contingent on our behavior. God says, I will do this if you do this. Um, If you ask, I will give. If you knock, you know, the door will be open. You know, those kinds of things. Those are are conditional things. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, uh, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So there's two sides. We're both walking through that covenant. Here's the agreement. This is the contract. If you do this, I will do this. But the promises that are contingent wholly and solely upon him are the ones we should rejoice about. And our salvation is one of those promises. What God did for Abraham was astounding. But what he does for us is even more astounding. God has given us a way to know him. God has given us a way to have life beyond the grave. God has given us a way to be sure that we are okay with him. And we should rejoice at that. We are people who have life eternal. We're filled with God's um, spirit. We 
we obtain his constant prayers as our support. We are made part of a family that comes from every tribe and nation. He's given each of us a way to contribute to that family that's unique and wonderful. Each of us has a part to play. And in his plan, no part is small. So what do we do in response to this? The Bible tells us that we will only get to heaven when we are those who join the chorus of those who bow and worship before the Lord. It is the only proper response. Gratitude is the only way to respond to what God has done for us. And here's the thing. We don't have to wait until heaven to praise Him. We should start praising Him right now. He's blessed us richly far more than we can even begin to comprehend now. We can praise Him with songs, our prayers, but we can also praise Him with our obedience, our devotion, and our passion to serve Him. God's great love for us should humble us. It should soften us. It should motivate us to praise Him until our dying breath. It should be the fuel of our obedience, the justification for our forgiveness of others, and the lead for and the passion behind our witness. The lackadaisical follower of Christ shows that they really don't get it. They don't understand what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do for those who put their trust in Him. If you get it, there will be a dramatic change in your orientation, your heart, and by virtue of God's amazing promise, you're forever. This is no dream. It's the incredible reality of the grace of God. So let's pray. Father, we have spent so much of our lives trying to earn a gift that has already been given to us. We've been trying to earn your favor. We've been trying to prove how worthy we are. We've been trying to get you to like us when all along you've told us that you already love us and that you sent Christ to die for us. Lord, help us to believe you. Help us to anchor our hope of eternity, not on our behavior, not on our religious deeds, but on your unchanging, faultless, incredible promise. Lord, help us to have the assurance that we crave so that we might have the freedom to serve you with a new energy, a new joy, and an eternal perspective which takes away our fear of life and of death. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.